And good evening, everybody. Let's get started. So let's start off with a couple announcements. Uh, first, don't forget homework eight is due next Wednesday, 12-2. So take a look at that. That is posted on the uh, Canvas site. Uh, second, don't forget about Lab 10. So Lab 10 is due uh, Monday, 12-7. So if you have any questions, you can uh, attend TA office hours or my office hours. Uh, unfortunately, today I will not be able to hold office hours, so I'm going to have to drop off right after class, uh, but I will be holding office hours as usual next week. So be sure to ask questions uh, uh, during this class via chat or unmuting, and otherwise please stay muted so we can keep the background noise low. So I wanted to continue today uh, and, and actually finish up with the topic of of motors. Uh, we talked about DC motors and we talked about speed control and directional control of DC motors. And so what you see on the screen right now is an H bridge built using switches. And of course, for electronic control, that's that's not so uh, realistic. Uh, you don't want mechanical switches in your circuit. So what we're going to do is continue the discussion about using um, transistors for an H bridge. So moving back to the whiteboard, this is where we left off last time uh, with the H bridge. So we have four transistors and we have a power supply and we have ground. And so when we wanted the motor to turn in the forward direction, we want current to go from left to right through this motor. So in order to do that, we had to have transistor A conducting, or I should say saturated, and also transistor D saturated. And so to tr saturate transistor A, since it's a PNP transistor, and we want current flowing from emitter out of the base, we need base current still to saturate that transistor. We apply zero volts at A, which is a logical zero. We have five volts at the emitter, so current flows and that transistor saturates. So we said A transistor or a logic signal A has to be a zero. We want B in cutoff, so B is an NPN transistor. We want no base current flowing from B down to ground, so B is also zero. C, transistor C, we want in cutoff. So we have, uh, we want to apply five volts to the C terminal here, which is a logic level one. And that makes the potential, the voltage on both sides of the base to emitter junction, five volts. So that means there's zero current flowing through the base. And then for D, we want current flowing. So we have to saturate that transistor by applying five volts to D, which is a logic level one. And so that will have current flow from left to right through that motor and the motor will turn in the forward direction. Okay, so in order to make the motor turn in the reverse direction, well, we can just switch all of the states. So what we want to do is we want uh, A in, in cutoff. Okay, so we will apply five volts to A, which is a logic level one. We want C to be conducting. Uh, and so that means we have to apply zero volts to C uh, so that we can have current flowing from the emitter out of the base. Oh, bring up my chat here. And then uh, let's see, we want uh, B to be uh, conducting for the current to go from right to left through the motor. So B has to be five volts, so current flows into the base, down to ground. And then D, we want uh, no current flowing, so that's also a zero. Okay, so if you were to, if you wanted to implement control of this motor in forward and reverse directions, you could connect four uh, outputs of a microcontroller to these logical inputs to the circuit, and then you could control the motor direction using 
these bit states uh, at the output of the microcontroller. So in software, just by controlling four bits uh, connected to this circuit, connected to this H bridge, you could control direction. Also, if you wanted to control speed, you could always modulate, uh, turn on and off, pulse width modulate uh, the the uh, these transistors so that you just stop one or more uh, of these transistors from allowing current to flow. So that would cause the, the motor to run at a slower speed if you pulse with modulate at a duty cycle less than 100%. So you could do both. You could take a microcontroller and do speed control and directional control with this H bridge. Um, professor, I had a question. Yeah. So um, when we're saying like logical zero and logical one for A, B, C, and D, is that always with reference to the base node for each one of those? Um, well, yeah, what I'm, what I'm defining is the logical variables are, are these here. Okay. Oh. So, so it's going to be either um, uh, five volts uh, for a logic one or zero volts for a logic zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case of like B, then we're saying that a one would allow the current to flow. So are we saying that the voltage at the collector there is zero volts? Um, so let's so see. So you're saying, it, so if we want current to flow, we would make B five volts. Yes. So does that mean that the collector, um, the voltage at the like collector node mm -hmm. is zero? And it's then about it's zero point two volts. Yeah. Oh, it's, okay. it's the VCE voltage uh, in saturation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. That's right. And then on the, and then you would want to actually uh, connect, you, you would want current to flow through C, so you would make uh, C zero volts, which would cause current to flow out of the base. And that would, that would uh, you know, let's use the 0.2 volts, you'd have 0.2 volts uh, here. So the node voltage on, so if this is 0.2 volts on the left side of the motor, it'd be about 4.8 volts on the right side of the motor. So you'd have about actually 4.6 volts across the motor. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Sure. Can you clarify one more time why for node C, um, zero volts will cause current to flow through? Yeah. Um, so for node C, in order to make current flow through that transistor, you, you, you want current flowing out of the base, right? You want your base current to be non-zero. This is a PNP transistor, which means current actually flows in the opposite direction compared to the NPN transistors. Okay, so voltages are negative of what you would think for NPN for, and, and current flows in the opposite way. So this, um, the, the, base to emitter junction, in this case emitter to base, right, looks like a diode in that direction. So you want you want to apply uh, plus minus five volts between those two polarities, right, in order to have current flow out of the base. And so just like in the NPN case, if you want current to flow uh, into the base in this direction, you want five volts pl like plus at D, uh, minus at the emitter because you have a diode that looks like this in the opposite direction. Okay, so the okay, thank you. The, yeah, the PN junctions are just exactly opposite NPN versus PNP. Mm -hmm. Other questions on this? And you know this this relates to oops, I lost my video. This relates to how you make um, you make current flow uh, through an LED, right? We had in the case where we had an LED. I, I threw a slide up that showed something like this. If I have uh, five volts node voltage applied at the top node, I need to apply zero volts at the bottom node in order to turn this LED on. If I want to turn the LED off. I apply five volts down here, that turns the LED off. That's the same configuration as the base to emitter junction uh, here for the PNP transistor. Okay. All right, so 
one more thing about HBridge is you can actually um, you can actually buy integrated circuits that that do this for you instead of using transistors, which there's there's no problem in using transistors. You can do that. Uh, there are some integrated circuits, though, if you need to control, for example, multiple motors. Um, here's here's how you might do that uh, with an integrated circuit. So this is called a quadruple half H driver IC. And, and really what it is, is it's two H bridges built into an integrated uh, circuit. And whenever you see a heat sink connection, that means that chip is going to get hot and needs to dissipate its heat somewhere. So this is a higher power chip. Uh, looking at how you would apply this chip, it would be like this. So in this dotted box here, this is the integrated circuit, or uh, I should say half of the integrated circuit is being used here. The M is the motor up top here. And forget about the diodes for now. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but there's a, a, a VCC2 that is the motor voltage and VCC1, which is the uh, powers the chip. That's the, uh, the chip's voltage. They can, they can be the same um, if you have a motor voltage equal to the chip power supply voltage. So what happens here is uh, notice that these triangles are drawn here. They are buffers. I mentioned buffers when we talked about logic gates and I said, well, a buffer doesn't really do anything. It takes a low and turns it into a low and a high and turns it into a high. Um, well, that's, that's important here because the input to the buffer is a very low power signal, maybe from a microcontroller and the output is high current. It can high either uh, source high current or sink high current. Um, so if you look, if I apply, let's say uh, a high to 2A, and a low to 1A, then I get a high at pin six, I get a low at pin three. That means I have a high, in other words, five volts, let's say on one side of the motor, and a low, zero volts, on the other side of the motor. And so the motor is gonna spin in a certain direction. To spin the motor in the opposite direction, just reverse uh, the logical inputs to these uh, two pins, to the 2A input and the 1A input and that'll spin the motor in the other direction. And you can also pulse with modulate uh, these input logical signals in order to slow the motor down. So all of that is documented down here. This is out of the data sheet, this, this table. So uh, you have to have an enable at logic level high, right, five volts, let's say, uh, to make the motor do anything. And then uh, enable would be uh, uh, low and it, basically disables the chip when the enable pin is low. And then you can see uh, low, like 1A and 2A states, low and high, turn right, high and low, turn left. And then there's this uh, fast motor stop, uh, which will apply the same potential to either side of the motor. So the motor will stop. These diodes up here actually, I mean, they're interesting when you look at them for the first time because Let's say VCC1 and VCC2 are the same values, five volts. Well, that means here at this motor terminal, either five volts or zero volts is applied. So if I apply five volts, um, well, then this diode doesn't do anything, this top diode, because both sides of the diode are at five volts. If you look at the bottom diode, if I have five volts at this left motor node here, this diode is reverse biased. So it doesn't do anything. And if I you know, switch the state to zero volts here at the motor, it, it, these, these diodes don't do anything. They're either, they either have the same potential at both sides or they're reverse biased, right? So they look like they don't do anything. Well, um, what happens is this, they do have a very important function. The uh, the motor itself, remember, is built out of coils of wire, and coils of wire have inductance. And remember LDIDT from talking about inductors. So if you try to cut off current very rapidly through a coil, you will get a very large either positive or negative voltage spike, and that energy is going to go somewhere. Um, so that's what these diodes do. If 
if I try to shut off this motor all of a sudden by, right, with this uh, function table down at the bottom, if I try to stop the current all of a sudden, or reverse directions, either way, um, if I get a big positive voltage spike trying to occur at this left terminal, well then, that positive voltage spike is actually going to be what they call snubbed by this top diode. Let's say it tries to go to six volts and the power supply is five volts. Current is going to flow through that diode and that diode will absorb the energy from the coil inside that motor. If the terminal here on the left tries to go to a big negative voltage before it gets too big, current is going to flow up from ground to that terminal when that voltage tries to go uh, much larger in magnitude than negative 0.7 volts. Oop. And so that's what, that's what these diodes do. They actually protect this integrated circuit and other integrated circuits by dissipating the energy that is stored in the, magnetic, in the form of the magnetic field in that motor um, so you don't burn out the chip. If that motor terminal were allowed without the diodes to go to you know, 1,000 volts because you shut off the motor very fast, it would probably destroy this chip. It would break down the junctions of the transistors in that chip, and it would just destroy it. So uh, the takeaway here is if you have projects in the future that use motors or use solenoids that you know, kind of like plungers that control things, uh, think very carefully about using diodes in your circuit because when you turn a motor or a solenoid on and off, uh, you will get a big voltage spike and you don't want to destroy the rest of your electronics because of that big voltage spike. Okay, any questions about this? So would that be a similar scenario if you're doing like uh, regenerative, I mean, like electric skateboard recharging when it's going downhill, um, if you wanted that switching or? Well, anywhere, anytime there's a coil uh, where you're changing the current rapidly, like turning it on or off, yeah, that, that will be an issue. You want to pay attention to those transient spikes that happen in voltage. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So quick question. Doesn't the forward voltage of that diode, it, doesn't that need to be extremely critical then? Um, it doesn't have to be that critical because once, for example, this left terminal of the motor tries to either go uh, 0.7 volts above uh, VCC2 or it tries to go 0.7 volts below zero, current will start to conduct. These chips can usually tolerate a little bit above or a little bit below their VCC values. So, so you know, if, if this is a five volt system, 5.7 volts is probably not going to destroy this chip, and negative 0.7 volts isn't going to destroy this chip. Positive a thousand volts or positive and negative uh, or, or negative a thousand volts, if if you didn't have those diodes, uh, would likely hurt that chip. Gotcha. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we covered DC motors. DC motors are simple. You apply power, you apply voltage, <clears throat> and the motor spins. And you can control the direction of the motor with the direction of the current. And you can control the, uh, one way to control the speed is pulse width modulation. We're going to move on next to uh, stepper motors. So stepper motors aren't so simple and they're a little, uh, they're more useful in many applications. Stepper motors are generally used for some kind of precision control. Uh, for example, precise speed control. If you need to turn a shaft at a, certain number, like 8.2 revolutions per second, uh, you might consider a uh, stepper motor. Now you can control a DC motor speed precisely, let's say with a control loop, but there are some cases where you might want uh, to use a stepper motor, uh, especially if you want to control the angle of the rotor, the shaft of the motor. So if you want to turn the motor 18 degrees to the right or 
maybe turn it two revolutions to the left and then stop, that would be a good application to consider a stepper motor. Uh, if you're looking for precision linear control, you can attach a belt or a chain and some gears or pulleys, and you can achieve very precise linear control with a stepper motor. Because again, you can control the speed of the shaft, the angle of the shaft, and you can translate that to linear position control. Examples where this would apply in certain applications, for example, uh, a printer head. When you have to move a, a printer head a certain distance at a certain speed in a printer, uh, that's a good application for a stepper motor. There are uh, lots of robotics applications where you need to uh, move a wheel, uh, point an arm, uh, move the position of an antenna, and that would be a good application for a stepper motor. And you've you know, you've probably used 3D printers. Many 3D printers use stepper motors in order to control the position of the of the head. And if you're grinding away metal, uh, instead of additive manufacturing, you're you're using a CNC machine. That's another application for a uh, stepper motor or two or three. So in these kinds of applications, you would seriously consider a stepper motor in order to achieve precision control. So stepper motors work like this, and this is how they achieve this precise rotor angle control. Um, here is a cross section of a stepper motor. So the stators around the outside, uh, the rotors around the inside, it can spin. And I want you to imagine this. So imagine you have a coil of wire that uh, maybe wraps around, I'll call it tab A here, and then goes behind the motor and then wraps around tab A prime. So you're creating a magnetic field between A and A prime with, with opposite poles. And the same thing for B, you wrap a wire around B, you wrap, a, it's keep that uh, wire going around maybe the back of this motor and then wrap it around B prime. You've created another electromagnet between B and B prime. The same with C and C prime and D with D prime. So if you've ever uh, you know, played with an electromagnet of a uh, battery and a couple nails and a coil of wire, you would notice that, that if, you, if, you, um, if you take, let's say, a, a nail, a steel nail, and you, you can use a fixed uh, magnet too to do this, uh, you, can, you can cause a nail, for example, to align uh, with the magnetic field uh, it, it'll straighten out in the direction of the magnets on either side of a nail. Uh, you can you can rotate it. That's the same principle that's happening here. Let me explain that with this figure. If I energize, I'll call it coil A or phase A. This rotor is not going to want to turn. This rotor wants to position itself so that it minimizes the gap uh, between A and tab one and a prime and tab four okay and and so this would become some kind of ferrous uh material um or ferrite material and then let's suppose i de-energize tab a a prime and i energize the coils for b and b prime what's going to happen is tab two is going to try to align itself with b and the rotor is going to spin, and tab five is going to try to align itself with B prime, right? It's trying to minimize the reluctance between, well, of this whole uh, magnetic system here, uh, just like a nail would straighten itself between two magnets. And so now you have to imagine B is aligned with two, B prime is al aligned with five. So then you energize C, you de energize B, energize C and C prime, and tab three will align with C, tab six will align with C prime, and so on. So you can achieve very precise, discrete, angular steps with a stepper motor. And so you can, you can uh, control angle very precisely, but with the resolution of a step, you could actually do half steps also, but um, that's how you achieve 
precise angular control. If you can achieve precise angular control, then by stepping through at a certain rate, you can achieve precise speed control. So let's look at how that might work. This is more conceptual because you probably wouldn't have a, a physical switch to do this, but you could use transistors. I'll show you that. Imagine that these four coils on the right are the coils of the stepper motor, A, B, C, and D. And you have maybe a six volt power supply for this six volt um, motor. Okay, well, if uh, doing just what I described before, if I energize coil A by applying current through coil A, then the motor will stay in the position that you see. If I move the switch to position B, then coil B is energized and the motor moves uh, one step clockwise. Then move the switch to C, motor moves another step, move the switch to D, the motor moves another step. And then you would see that, well, you could move the switch all the way back to A and continue the steps uh, through this motor. So that's how that would work. I have a, an animation here that'll, that'll show you how this works. Hopefully this comes out on Zoom. So you could see that as the different phases are energized, that center, uh, the rotor will align itself uh, so that it moves a discrete step in angle. And you can cause this motor to go in the clockwise direction by what I'm showing here. And if you want the motor to turn the opposite direction, well, energize the phases in the opposite order. That's all you need to do. Motor will turn in the opposite direction. And you could stop anytime. You just stop energizing the phases, uh, stop changing the phase uh, uh, sequence, and then the motor the rotor will just stop uh, at that current position. So this is also why stepper motors, if you listen to your printer or anything with a stepper, they, these motors kind of have a whine to them. And it's because you're hearing the audio created by the, uh, the, the vibrations of that, uh, of that step as the motor makes these steps. Here's an example stepper motor. Um, and this is actually a really small motor. And this is from the data sheet. This is a five volt motor. And this is a way to control the phases of this motor with a transistor. So you can see inside I have the coils. Um, they're not really labeled, but what is labeled is the, uh, the, the colors of the wires. So you have yellow, red, orange, brown, green, black coming out of this motor. So it's not as simple as a DC motor. DC motor, you apply a battery to the two wires coming out of the motor and it spins. This motor has six wires coming out of it and you have to control it in some way. And this is one way to do that. Uh, this uses a common value of five volts applied to the two uh, sets of coils. So here, red and green are attached to the center taps of these coils and you would actually ground uh, the other wires in order to energize the appropriate phase. At the bottom here, you can see this is how you energize Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, right? So those are these four transistors down here. So you would have maybe a logic signal coming out of a microcontroller or four logic signals through a resistor designed such that when you apply five volts logic, the transistors get saturated. So you can see here, if you want counterclockwise rotation, then you energize in this order, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, step one is Q1 saturated, Q2 cutoff, Q3 saturated, Q4 cutoff. And then to move one step, right, saturate Q1, cutoff, Q2, uh, cutoff, Q3, saturate Q4, and so on. If you want to reverse the direction, um, then energize these states in, in the opposite order. Okay, so, so the six wires interfacing uh, to the stepper motor uh, give you access to all of the phases or the, the coil windings here. And you, you actually have to provide the external control uh, through these windings to control the position and the speed of the rotor. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so 
in order to like increase the angular, I guess, velocity of the of the of the motor itself, couldn't you switch instead of going on off on off? You like say this is positive, or I guess whatever pole it's at currently is positive, and so to get from the next pole that pole to the next one, couldn't you also make the pole that it was previously at negative so that it repulses and goes faster? Um. I just, I mean, I guess in theory you could if you, uh, I, I think you'd have to time that very carefully because if you, if you repel, if, if you apply a repelling force, uh, you don't know which way it's going to turn, right? So you'd have to actually start, you'd actually probably, have, well, I haven't tried this, but I would say if you wanted to try this, you'd have to energize the next, you'd have to de-energize the present state. You have to energize the next step, right? And then maybe sometime after that, you would apply the repelling force. I mean, it's, it's worth a shot, but typically they're not, they're not uh, operated that way, but, but you could give it a try. Yeah, I was thinking like high power, like in terms of like electric motorcycles and stuff like that, where you kind of want the speed. Um, and I was just curious as to how you would flip that polarity so quickly. If I wanted to, if I wanted high power, um, I would use a, uh, you know, you know, some other kind of motor other than a stepper motor. Um, because, okay. you know, for example, in a motorcycle application, I don't know. I, I think, I think I would do better with using another kind of motor. Um, because I don't need precise angular control of the wheel. Um, and I would even argue not even precise speed control because you could you could actually take another type of motor, even a DC motor, put it in a closed loop and do your cruise control that way. It would be close enough. But uh, but but it is it is an interesting uh, you know that'd be interesting to do with a microcontroller and and try that. Um, um, yeah. The problem is these motors typically aren't wired that way. The uh, phases on the opposite side of the shaft, like on you know 180 degrees out, are usually tied together. So, or at least have a common point in the center, like this one does. So I don't know that you could do that unless you broke out like where this red wire is. You'd have to break that out into two wires in order to do that. Just okay. thinking off the top of my head here. So, yeah. so that that motor that you showed as an example, that would be considered a two-phase motor, right? Um, this would be, I would consider this a four phase motor because okay. I can energize each one of these phases, <clears throat> these coils individually. All right. Well, wouldn't it be like, if looking at more like the, the circular example, wouldn't that be like, a, B, A, B, right? Like this one's plus, this one's off, then this one's plus, then this one's off. So you only have on own. Well, here I have four, you know, I, I do have four states, uh, just like I had, let me go back a uh, couple. Just like here, I had I had these, these four different step states that I could energize. Mm -hmm. um, I still have four states here. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. So I understand um, the angle control with um, the windings, but is speed control for that just like how quickly the phases that we change which phases we're energizing? That's right. If you, for example, had, let's, let's just make this up. Let's say that there's 18 degrees between each one of these phases. So every step is 18 degrees. Um, then if you, every one second change the states, you would have 18 degrees per second. If you uh, change states every half second, you would have 36 degrees per second. So yes, you, you change the time period between state changes and that's how you would control speed. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's another uh, stepper motor 
uh, data sheet. This is information from a data sheet. So you can see just different notation. There's a, there's a common red wire. This stepper motor has actually five wires coming out of it because the center tap of these coils is common internal to the motor. And, and then on the right, you can see that if you apply a common positive voltage to the red wire, then uh, you can see which wires you have to apply to ground. You have to connect to ground through a transistor or otherwise in order to maintain this step. On the left here, I have a uh, that that Darlington array that I showed earlier when we were talking about driving loads from microcontrollers, uh, that could absolutely be used in order to drive a stepper motor. I've used these chips before with small stepper motors. Um, and in fact, these have the diodes built in, so you don't have to apply external diodes in order to uh, uh, protect the chip. So logic levels would come in on the left, maybe A through D. Uh, you'd connect the, the phases, black, brown, orange, yellow, to the output A through D and then you'd control the phases uh, uh, with a microcontroller and you'd of course apply maybe five volts for a five volt motor to the red wire up here. So lots of different ways to uh, control the current through the phases. And there are actually specialized uh, integrated circuits you can use with motors that have the built-in diodes. And, and you can, in fact, use one of those H-Bridge chips that I showed earlier that that one was uh, normally used for a DC motor, but there's no reason you couldn't use that for, for this uh, stepper motor application. Okay, and so here's another motor. And again, you'll see this is common for uh, data sheet information, shows you how to energize the phases to get the different steps, uh, the colors of the wire. Uh, this data sheet, I pulled out some information. So the coil resistance here was 90 ohms. So you can use, you can use Ohm's law to figure out, well, if it's a five volt motor, 90 ohms per phase, then each phase needs 55 milliamps. That would be too much for a microcontroller to control directly out of its IO port, right? So you'd have to, You'd have to have uh, a transistor or some other driver in between the microcontroller and the motor in order to supply enough current. This particular motor had 20 steps per resolution, uh, revolution, and so the resolution is 18 degrees uh, per, per full step. And so stepper motors typically require, the kind of the takeaway here is t stepper motors typically require more current per phase than a microcontroller could provide out of a digital output port. So that's why we looked at, right, for your future product projects or products, um, that's why we looked at a transistor driver so that you could see that you can control a lot of current with very little current. Okay, so, so stepper motors are, one way to control the angle of a shaft and they have a continuous turn. In other words, you could, you could turn it 300, uh, 300 turns of the shaft and then back up two turns and go forward 18 degrees or whatever. Um, there's another type of motor called a servo motor. So a servo motor um, usually control either linear motion or angular motion also very precisely. So you might see these on RC cars, if you've ever used an RC car, radio control car, or radio controlled airplane, you'll see these servos uh, mounted to control steering or control control surfaces. Um, they're also used in, well, non-hobby applications and high torque industrial applications too. So anywhere you need precise linear um, or angular motion, you might use a, uh, a servo motor. Let's dig into that servo motor a little bit more. I'll show you what's inside. So let's, let's generally define a servo mechanism. A servo mechanism uses feedback, actually uses negative feedback, just like an op amp, to achieve a desired result, okay, uh, position, or speed, for example. 
Um, just like your op amp circuits uh, drove the input differential voltage to zero, these servo mechanisms drive their error voltage or error to zero. So you have a commanded position and an actual position. The difference is an error. So a servo mechanism, just like op amps, uses a negative feedback to uh, minimize some quantity, in this case, error. Uh, a servo motor, typically just called a servo, typically controls position of a shaft, and you can set the desired position using a, a control signal. And so the Negative feedback is used to minimize the difference between the actual position and the commanded position and uh, get you what you want um, in terms of controlling the shaft angle. Okay. So if you look at, mm -hmm, go ahead. Oh, so I mainly wanted to ask, so what's the difference with achieving linear or angular precision with a servo mo motor versus with the stepper motor that like we were just talking about. Yeah, one, one big difference is this, that servos are generally designed so that they only have uh, 90 or 180 degrees um, for these types of servo motors of rotation. So you can't keep them going around continuously. There are some exceptions. There are some continuous servo motors, but generally these are meant to control uh, an angle within a range of maybe 90 or 180 degrees. Okay, so a stepper motor, you can keep them uh, uh, turning for multiple revolutions. These servo, mo servo motors, you generally cannot. Um, another difference is these servo motors, uh, because it's this uh, analog um, uh, control signal going in, you can have you can have very precise, I'll say smaller changes in angle that can be controlled. The stepper motor that you saw, it had an 18 degree resolution. Now you could gear it down. If I have a two to one gear ratio or something like that, I could get nine degrees or you can imagine how to gear it down even more. Um, step, uh, servo motors are, and depends on the servo motor, but you, you can have very fine control of, of the position um, uh, and it's it's either analog or it's so many bits of resolution that you have a, have sub degree accuracy of the shaft angle. Okay, so so big differences. Um, stepper motors can turn continuously and keep turning. Ser servo motors cannot. Servo motors can have a finer resolution of angle usually compared to a stepper motor. And so, um, could you say again what how the servo exactly achieves that sub degree angle mm -hmm. turn that um, the stepper can't? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you that right here. So this is um, this is an example of a servo motor, and generally on the right here, this is a block diagram of of how it works. So there there's a motor controller inside, and the inputs to that motor controller. Uh, so this this whole big blue rounded corner block is the servo motor right? and it has electrical signals coming in and an output shaft. So into this servo motor is uh, a power input, a control signal and a ground. And so what that motor controller does is this, let's, let's say you have a commanded position and let's suppose that the commanded position is not equal to the actual position of the shaft. I'll talk about that in a second, how that works. So the motor controller would apply power to this internal DC motor uh, to turn it left or right, right, one way or the other. And that motor is going to turn and it's gonna turn several, that shaft will turn several times. And then there's a gearbox, small gearbox, that reduces that uh, those turns down to a, a smaller number of turns. Uh, for this output shaft. Now, there has to be some feedback. So this motor controller has to know the actual position of the shaft in order to know which way to turn the DC motor. So that output shaft is connected to a potentiometer, right? Remember a potentiometer uh, can be used to sense angular position, right? What we did is 
what you did is you took a potentiometer and you change its angular position in order to control a voltage. Well, remember, you, well, note that you can, you, can, uh, you can map a voltage out of a potentiometer, right, in a voltage divider configuration. You can map that voltage to a particular angle. So just by measuring the voltage out of a potentiometer set up like a voltage divider, you can know the position of its knob. So the shaft is directly connected to that knob, um, uh, the wiper of the potentiometer. So now this voltage coming out goes into the motor controller. So now it knows, okay, I have an error. I have to turn right. Uh, don't know how, how long, how much, but I have to turn right. And so start turning the motor right. And then when uh, the expected voltage of that potentiometer or the expected angle um, is reached, the motor controller removes power from that DC motor. Okay, so that's how it worked. That's, this is the feedback loop right here. I have a commanded, uh, commanded position through the control signal. I'll tell you how that works in a second. Commanded position, I know the actual position because of the voltage out of the potentiometer. So I'm going to run this DC motor one way or the other in order to make that shaft position equal to commanded position. Um, here's the internals of a servo motor. So you can see the motor controller is on the circuit board right here. Um, and so that motor controller connects to this internal DC motor. So this is the internal DC motor. So you see a couple wires here. So when the motor is supposed to turn one way, maybe this, you know, uh, red to black is a positive voltage. If the motor has to turn the other way, opposite direction, red to black would be maybe a negative voltage. And you can see the gears up here. So this, these gears reduce uh, many turns of this motor to one turn of that shaft with an arm on it here. Here's the, here's the axis of the shaft right through the center of that arm and goes down to, this is a potentiometer. There are three, uh, three terminals here on this potentiometer. And you can see three wires coming back to the motor controller. And so that's physically what is inside. It's exactly what this block diagram says. And uh, the, that uh, function I described is impl implemented by this, uh, this motor controller. So the power input explains how that motor would turn. Um, the uh, uh, ground is common, uh, is a common ground for this servo motor. Now, what about the control signal? So typically for these small servo motors, there is a, uh, a pulse width range defined to control the angle of the servo motor. So this, these small servo motors, uh, the typical rotation range is 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And so you use a pulse width modulation to control the angle uh, of the servo shaft. And so what you do is you apply pulses to the controls. So you power the motor, apply power, apply ground, and then pulse uh, the control input with a period of 20 milliseconds. And again, this is common. You have to look at the data sheet for the exact frequency, but this is a common value. Uh, so a frequency of 50 hertz, these pulses. And then you um, adjust the pulse duration between one millisecond and two milliseconds in order to control uh, the angle. And so you would you would um, use a microcontroller with its timer peripherals that we talked about to create a pulse that happens every 20 milliseconds and with a width of uh, one to two milliseconds, right? So a five to 10% duty cycle. Um, so an example is if you have a servo motor that turns 90 degrees, rotates 90 degrees, one millisecond pulses might correspond to zero degrees. Two milliseconds would correspond to 90 degrees. Uh, 1.5 milliseconds would be 45 degrees. And there's a mapping between pulse width and angle. And so that's how the, uh, the motor uh, is, is commanded. It's with these pulses.
so the, the, the key points here um, are these servo motors uh, uh, use a control signal and negative feedback to position a motor shaft, right? That was that feedback diagram, that diagram, uh, block diagram I showed you. And although the servo motor does use uh, a DC electric motor, it uses it in a little different way. It's like a DC motor plus has surrounding mechanical components and, and circuits. So servo motors use a pulsed voltage to control position. Okay, but the PWM uh, achieves a specific angle. Contrast that with DC motors alone, and they also can use uh, PWM, but that's used to control the speed of the motor. So, so uh, different uh, results from P for PWM applied to each of these motors, the servo motor and the DC motor. If you compare the uh, servo motor to a stepper motor, the servo motor's shaft angle is controlled using closed loop control with negative feedback and commanded by pulse width. Uh, a stepper motor, the shaft angle is controlled by energizing phases or the coils uh, to the motor. Okay, so this kind of gives you, again, more information, another feel for the, for the differences between these motors. And you might sit and think about these, you know, what applications would you use, let's say, if you have an electric bike or you have, uh, you're trying to make a CNC machine or you're trying to control precise pointing of a laser at something, you know, they, they all involve, they all could use different types of motors, DC motors, servos, stepper motors, but uh, depending upon the requirements, you, you might choose one over the others. Okay, so we have reached uh, time to close the class up today. Uh, don't forget homework eight is due uh, next Wednesday, December 2nd, and lab 10 will be due Monday, 12, seven. So you have some time to work on that. And I will, uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to hold office hours today. So I'm going to have to drop off right after class. If you have any questions, um, about any of the assignments, please post them to uh, Slack with information about your problem and I or the TAs or others will um, give you some help there. Um, if you have any uh, problems that have to be discussed, uh, you would like to discuss with me uh, personally, uh, please uh, email me those. So thanks for joining the live class. I hope you have a good uh, couple days off. Um, of course, there's no lab this Friday. Uh, be safe, be well, and um, I'll see you on Monday.